Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is from Luke, the 13th chapter, where we read these words from Jesus. He said to them, Make every effort to enter through that narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. This is our text. Well, this morning I'd like to welcome back to our sanctuary, Mr. Ben Peterson. It's been a while since we've seen Ben up here, and while he is no longer on the track to become a, a reverend, he is on the road to soon becoming a father, if you know what I mean. Congratulations, Ben. Ben, Alexis was here last night. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. We're all looking forward to meeting your little one soon, Ben. By the way, Philip is a very good man. <laughs> yes, it's a splendid name, but, you know, we already have a Philippa among the little one's beautiful savior now. Your own granddaughter. I think it's time for a new line. A new line? I've been using that line for 30 years. I've encouraged every single young family to name their child Philip. What would you possibly suggest better than that? How about, you know, Ben is a very good name. <laughs> it doesn't quite have the flavor of Philip. No. Why not? Because it's not my name. <laughs> How about this? Congratulations on the upcoming birth of your child. I'll be excited to hear what name you parents choose for your little one. I see. So you think I'm being a little pushy with the Philip thing, huh? All right, I'll try it. Congratulations on the upcoming birth of your child. I'll be excited to hear what you parents choose for your little one. That's it. You know, Philip means lover of horses. It's a great name for a strong yet elegant child. You just can't give it up, can you? Anyway, why am I here? Surely not to discuss baby names. Surely, by the way, is also a good name. It's my mother-in-law's name, actually. But I brought you up here today because I would like to do with you a little experiment. See these two tables? Hard to miss. I would like you to walk between them and go right up there into the chancel. Walk between them and go right up there into the chancel. They're awfully close together. I, I don't think I can. Maybe you with your newly developed thin waist and trim body to do it, but certainly not me. I thank you for noticing. <laughs> How kind of you to comment on my weight loss. It, it's written in the script. <laughs> Ooh, I, I don't actually remember writing that. Perhaps you added it later. Oh, well, no matter. Let's move the tables apart ourselves a bit, okay? What's the smallest amount that you think you could squeeze through? How about that? Uh, a little more. Maybe? Yeah, let me try. Very nice. Through the tables? Why would I do that? Same reason as me. A reason you don't know. True, but what's good for the goose going, you know? A goose? Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm guessing this experiment has something to do with the narrow door that Jesus talks about in our gospel lesson for today, right? Yes, Jesus says in the text, strive to enter to the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Here's my question for you today. <clears throat> Why doesn't Jesus say that it's a wide door? After all, as Christians, we know all that is necessary to gain entry into heaven is believing in Jesus as our Savior, trusting in Him for forgiveness, relying on His blood-bought gift of redemption for us. And faith itself is a gift that comes from God, a free gift. We can't earn it or deserve it. So it's not actually so hard, is it? 
So the door isn't really so narrow after all, right? No, I suppose in that sense it's not. It's not narrow because God somehow expects that we perfectly keep certain rules or flawlessly live by certain behaviors. That would be impossible. He knows that we're sinners, and that's why he sent Jesus to pay the price for our sin. Exactly. Jesus did all the hard work, all the impossible stuff. He was perfect and holy God, and yet he went forward and accomplished the seemingly unimaginable work of becoming one of us, knowing our temptations and sins, dying our death, and rising again on our behalf. So you think Jesus uses the term narrow to reflect the fact that only Jesus could open the door. No one else, even the most famous celebrity or the most important earthly king, only Jesus. Only Jesus. And yet, the door itself is not narrow because faith is a free gift. Yes, it does seem to me that Jesus and only Jesus could make possible our entry into heaven because only he is righteous enough to be the appropriate sacrifice. Anyone else would have been tainted with the infection of sin, couldn't have paid the price. But he did all that. And so the free gift is ours through faith. Narrow door only can be opened by Jesus. Why door? Because God gives us everything we need to believe. Okay, I can see that. But doesn't it seem like there's more to it than that? Jesus' words make it sound like many will not find their way through the narrow door. Many will not have their sins covered over by the blood of Jesus and will not consequently be saved. Wide as it may seem to be who believe, it's not so wide that everyone just walks right in. In fact, it sounds like many, most, will not be saved. Well, you're right. It does sound like the way is narrow because so many people get caught up in other things and turn aside from the narrow door. And what do you think that means? Well, I think it's a bit like the deck at the back of my house. A couple of weeks ago, I had to replace some boards in it because some water had seeped into the cracks in the board. Over time, the water gradually rotted away the board from the inside out. No good anymore. It seems to me that certain issues might chip away at someone's faith in Jesus, such that it puts the very core of their belief in jeopardy. Thus, they fail to enter through the narrow door because something else works its way into first place in their heart. And the next thing you know, they sacrifice Jesus for the other thing. You mean like some type of sin? Mm -hmm. So there's some area of their lives which they value more than they do their relationship with God. And as that persists, they end up suddenly being sucked in by the thing, whatever that thing is, and lose their identity as God's people. Exactly. And it can be different for each individual. Some are more lured by the materialism of our age. Others are caught in a particular habitual, unchecked iniquity. Some come to see God just as a pastime. Others let the urgencies of life squeeze God out of their schedules and hearts. And the upshot is not that the door became narrower for them, but that they started seeking their strength in other gods, their confidence from the things of this world. And the narrow door of reliance upon Christ alone became so obscured that they just couldn't find it anymore. So, unrepentant sin in our lives can be one of the ways that we obscure the narrow door of salvation. Are there others, you think? I do. Some people, it seems, have trouble holding on to their faith as they face some trials and storms, what Pastor Otto called discipline. While God is there to assist them through the brokenness that characterizes this world, nevertheless, the tempter leads them to question God and his love, to forget about all the good that he has done for them, and to focus instead on the challenges and hardships. I know someone whose father lost a battle with cancer, and he's very angry at God. He's struggling with doubts and questions. Exactly, and the tempter is very happy to capitalize on those kinds of things to try and twist our thinking. He figures that a good old dose of doubt is likely to lead us away from the cross of Jesus. Okay, so hardship can also make the door narrow. I think there's other things too, perhaps. Are there other things that make the door narrow for people? Other things that 
challenge people from trusting in the God who opened his arms to save us? Well, of course there are those who haven't heard or understood the good news of Jesus. The narrow door is a mystery to them because no one has shared the fact that Jesus carried their sins and won their victory on the cross. So you're suggesting that many out there are confused, that they need someone to open up the pages of the Bible so that they can understand better all that God did in Jesus to save us. Yeah, the door is narrow for them because they don't know about Jesus. Think about the millions and millions who place their hopes in some other false deity, some other false prophet, a philosopher, government leader, a pretender. We believers in Christ need to open our eyes and begin speaking of our Savior to all who are willing to listen. There's no more important message. And, and yet, actually, too many Christians sort of make the door narrow by just saying in their heads, oh, well, I guess me and my non-Christian friend will just have to disagree. I wouldn't want to make him feel bad by suggesting that my Savior might also be his Savior. So the narrow door actually is, in many ways, a narrow door. Not because God has made it difficult, but because we, as sinners, are easily misguided. Our minds get sucked in by the temper and its delusions, our society and its distractions, and our own selfish pride, greed, and tendency to doubt God and his love. Yeah. Thank God that despite all that, he absolutely refused to give up on us. And faced with the option of taking the easy road and letting us self-destruct, or taking the narrow, difficult road and sacrificing everything so that we might be saved, he chose the latter. Yeah, Jesus put it all on the line for us. The torture, the agony, the pain. God loved us that much. And every day he comes to us and by the power of his Holy Spirit guides us away from the distractions, the deceptions, and the delusions so that we continue to recognize Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And when we falter, giving a place in our hearts to the tempter in his ways or yielding to the doubts that Satan wants to kindle in us, our Lord comes with the good news that, in Christ, we're forgiven. And he picks us up and puts us back on track. Today I've given everyone a three by five red piece of paper so that when they come to receive Christ's body and blood, they might symbolically lay down those things that might bring them challenges before God. I'm thinking that on the card they might write down the initial or a particular symbol of something that is a struggle or personal problem or difficult question <clears throat> that causes them doubt. And as they come to receive Christ's most precious gift, I intend for them to lay down that card, face down on the table, <clears throat> putting their struggle symbolically into the hands of him who loves us, forgive you, forgives us, rescues, and helps us. Cool idea. But maybe you want to pull the tables just a little bit further apart. After all, though we might be called to suffer for the gospel, I'm not sure we're called to do it right here in church. Okay, let's do that. That should do it. Well, welcome back, Ben. Thanks for your help in understanding this text. It's, it's good to be back. And remember, Philip is a very good name. Lover of horses, I remember. And horses are a good mode of transportation, but you know, my wife has a beat. How's that? Well, a horse is much slower than a Lexus. It is a Lexus. On that note, thank you for returning. We will see you another time, maybe. Narrow or wide? It's really all how we look at it. God has given us all that we need. It's not hard, and yet it is hard because there are so many distractions in the world, so many places that can lead us astray. Thank God that he is there with us to offer us his help and strength to lift us up when we fail. 
May God bless you as you travel through that narrow road. And as you do so today, drop your cards here. Nobody's going to look at them, but you can put whatever symbol you want. Because that's what you take up to you as you take up with you to the altar. As you come before the Lord Jesus. And he comes to you and says, here I am for you with whatever it is you are dealing with today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.